use cases of Web3 through DPIN. This episode is sponsored by Peak, the layer one blockchain purpose built to power DPINs. Peak is about to launch. Check their website at peak.network right now. Hello, everyone. Daniel from DPIN Hub here. Today, I'm excited to interview Michael, CEO and co founder of Rome Network. Rome is on a mission to reshape how we understand and improve mobile phone service quality worldwide by building a global network coverage of maps through crowdsourced data from mobile phones, or aka DPIN projects. Thanks so much for joining the podcast, Michael. It's really nice to have you here. Uh, we've been talking for quite some time, actually. We met in Austin, spent some time brainstorming about like network connectivities. Uh, like my girlfriend's Bulgarian, you're from Bulgaria, you live in Finland. I used to live in Finland. There's a lot of you know synergies between us. And also I've been following what Rome has been building. It's super exciting. And so I'm very hyped to have you on the podcast. But let's get started. You introduce yourself, what you guys are building, and how does the project got started? Yeah, thank you for having me here. So I've been a huge fan even before I knew you in person. So I've been using the hot potty for uh, some of the uh, Loravan uh, project that they had before. And Deep in Hub is my source of information. So I'm, I'm quoting uh, the projects and the summaries there. So actually, it's, uh, it's awesome that uh, this is actually one of the best part of the Web3 community that I have found that you can actually meet the people and talk real deal stuff and to actually make things happening. So, uh, yeah, you asked me how I started. So maybe that's the, that's the start. So, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a telecom guy. So actually my career has been in telecommunication networks. Uh, I was, uh, studying telecommunication when the time when my uh, professors were studying that one day the phones will be that small, you know, because they were this big at that time. And then after that, uh, now we have uh, phones that are much larger than we had before, because it's not a phone anymore. It's a, uh, multimedia device or computer in your pocket. And then I actually started working for a company called Nokia in Finland. That's why I moved from Bulgaria to Finland back in 2001. And I was uh, building the first data network, so native data networks for mobile phones. There was a called something called GPRS or uh, 2.5G networks, and then came the 3G networks. And I was one of the team in Nokia building the first 3G networks in uh, Hong Kong, in Hutchison and uh, UK. And then it was uh, 3G, 4G, now 5G. And the last 15 years actually been dealing with uh, Internet of Things technologies, which is another way to say that not only humans are using uh, mobile services, but also devices like your water meter, uh, like your car. Your... Nowadays, everybody talk about Tesla, but actually most of the cars in Europe are now connected and everything else. Uh, and this is actually how uh, I got started in the whole of... Uh, Web3 space because I saw that uh, telecom has reached a stage where uh, the next uh, major technology is coming as an enablement, same as uh, cloud came in telecom and Internet of Things came in telecom, same as uh, Web3 came, not as a technology, but also as a business model. And the example was that in Nokia was uh, selling uh, LoRaWAN networks and companies such as Comcast, uh, the largest cable operator in the world, I mean, they were trying to build the coverage of LoRaWAN for IoT service in the U.S. alone, and they couldn't. I mean, company with billions of potential investment, they couldn't do it. And uh, one or two years later, here comes a company that is not even a, let's call it a full uh, major company or even here for sure billions, called Helium, and they managed to build not only U.S. but global coverage with uh, equipment that they don't own and services they don't deliver and. Uh, and actually deliver something which is useful, which is the actual interesting part. So, and uh, this is actually for me was an amazing uh, idea that you can actually use uh, technology, you can use crowdsourced as colloquial code or decentralized ownership, and then uh, build something that makes sense and that creates a real world value. And that's uh, that's my that's my idea. This is how my definition of deep in now is actually. Uh, Practically speaking, uh, cloud plus uh, Internet of Things uh, as an actual concept plus blockchain technology. And this is all what we call now deep in projects. So yeah, let's uh, let's see what we can do together as a community. Yeah, exactly. I think you've been like uh, in this space for much, much longer than most people. I lived in Finland in 2004 and I was already surprised how advanced at the time Finland was, was compared to the rest of the world, right? I think they, they lost a little bit of that edge. But it was so interesting, like I, the Symbian phones, you know, being able to send emails from your phone. I was like, wow, this is actually impressive. So you have a lot of background on, on telco and, and understand the problems, right? 
And when, when did it come like this idea of like build the wrong network? And what are you guys trying to achieve with people's phones? Yeah, so the original idea of Roam Network came to a bunch of colleagues here in Finland already in 2001. So this was even before Helium announced the 5G part. And the idea was to decentralize the ownership and the operations of uh, mobile networks in general. So to build uh, networks of networks uh, rather than one global central network. And uh, ultimately, it became a question of actionable insight, right? You know something, but what can you really do about it uh, without the funding and without the enablement? So um, in 2002, then I was uh, like approached by the couple of the guys, so the original idea owners. And then I kind of liked the idea, especially because at that time I had already co-founded uh, a company in Bulgaria. So again, my native country, which was doing with uh, Internet of Things connectivity. And then I was actually surprised that there is a helium coverage in Bulgaria. So, And then uh, we actually decided in Bulgaria, that's why the deep in hub uh, or the hotspot if linked, that hmm, let's check. And then hotspot showed me that the amount of gateways that were delivered to Laura miners in Bulgaria, we could never deliver ourselves. So I was then fully convinced that this is the path forward. And then I was looking for what can I bring in this space. And um, I like the concept that, yeah, let's build uh, something for the humans, the so-called mobile networks of humans, right? The 5G or 4G, and not just the devices. And then uh, when we analyze the problem, uh, what can we really build and what is scalable and global, we realize that we have something in front of our eyes, the actual phone, that is the... Uh, ultimate user of the service, but ultimate uh, sensor of the service. So uh, let's use the phone as an actual sensor to determine before we build it, what and where we should build it. And then let's use the uh, decentralized ownership of, uh, of the asset to actually build the actual networks where it's needed. And then let's use the capability to decentralize the uh, value exchange and uh, use the blockchain technology to have the full transparency and traceability and composability of the service there when it needs so that's why the first demo that we did was an actual showing how we can purchase uh, uh, internet uh, traffic or access to internet from a nokia 4g base station because this was actually the first direction but then um, we realized that uh, globally scalable is the system that let's first see where the network is needed and then once we know this once we have this digital twin of the world or i mean digital twin is an iot concept let's call it a, a map of the world with coverage then uh, we can actually build it. So that's why we're focusing now on the first phase on let's map the world, let's uh, show to the users what they're using and let's uh, see if the users like it or not and then uh, let's uh, try to solve it as a later stage. So that's why the, the vision is so much bigger that we're showing now. Uh, but as uh, my experience in building uh, real technologies that uh, you can dream about as much as you want but if you can don't if you don't execute it it's just a, it's just a fantasy so and i think uh, a lot of projects are living in the world of fantasy because they lack the uh, reality check so uh, at least my idea is that uh, let's build something which is uh, real and then expand from there yeah no i, I think it, that makes a lot of sense and um, and especially like uh, i've been also using rom on like a, on the phone that i have and it's, it's, maybe can you explain what are you guys doing right now? And uh, what are the, the main problems that you guys are trying to solve with that? Like trying to figure out the, the real coverage around the world for telco service. What people, of course, see is that uh, they see this, uh, this uh, signal bars on the phone, which is the top uh, right corner. But uh, what in reality is that there's a lot of complex parameters on the phone. And typically the signal strength is what people see in the signal bars. And this is only one parameter. I typically like to explain it as a signal strength is like how many lanes you have on the road, right? This shows you how fast you can drive typically, because if you have two lanes, it's uh, slow. I mean, if you have five, this is typically a highway. But then this is not enough because on the road, you could have also holes or you could have roadworks or you could have maybe even other users which could slow you down. And that's the second parameter, which is the quality. So what we start by showing to you as a user is this signal strength and quality. So you can have a informed understanding what is the network and then show you the actual speed that you could achieve in this cell. In my case, uh, now it is 16 megabits per second. So that's it basically. So uh, in this cell, it's 16 megabits that you can achieve. Of course, if you're curious and you want to see it, there is a lot of data which you collect. So basically we show that you're now connected to, or I'm connected to a network called Telia, which is the Finnish network, which I actually know. And this network has a certain cell IDs, a certain nearby cells and 
and this is all technical data that doesn't mean anything to the user, but uh, to a knowing uh, customer, so your local mobile network operator or their competitor actually, when they get this data, they can analyze it, or even we can help them analyze it, and they can build better service for you so that not 16, but they could get uh, 64 megabits per second and actually get better quality. So that's in essence what we do now. So we solve your problem of how good your connection to the internet is by giving you understanding the data that your phone already collects. Because to be very clear, we're not inventing the data, we're just showing you the data that the phone collects. And then we enable this data to be uh, monetized for you, of course, and for the project, so that when somebody buys the data, you get a representation of the value that this data has created. So that, in short, is what we do. Just the data by itself is already interesting, but then once you aggregate that data for the entire world, right? I think that's actually when things are getting like interesting as well. Right now, like uh, by what would a normal person do if you can show like the real quality, real coverage around the world? Like would help me choose between shifting from Telia to another company. Uh, what, how do you envision the, the first use case of the ROM data? That is the first use case, actually. Um, even for a, for a consumer service, uh, is the first you can check your phone as a... I mean, we had an idea to put it even as a, you know, the radioactive counter, this Geiger counter that you could peep, 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 move around, but then we thought it would be too scary for people. So actually, if you move around the room or if I go closer to the window, in my case, uh, this would increase. So what it means that if I want to guarantee that I have the right service uh, for a good connection, maybe it should be in a place that there is a good connection. So this is immediate utility, right? Um, of course, the other story is that, uh, and this is something that we're planning to build, that uh, we could have a benchmark that uh, in the places I have walked to or have been, I could get a report. And this is actually what we'll be releasing in the next version of the app, just as a, just as a little... Uh, a site review. So uh, yeah, the version of the app will then show you the for the last month what has been my uh, maximum speed and what has been average speed for the month. So then me as a user can select, oh, is this what I'm paying for? Because if I'm paying for 300 megabits per second and I'm, if I'm getting most of the time only 20, what does it mean for my connection? And of course, then it could be actionable insight. Then I can choose, do I want to switch my connection to somebody else? Do I want to a new phone because this phone is not good enough, for example. And uh, this would all something that they can immediately use and they can immediately benefit beyond and above, you know, the points and the uh, the future uh, value representation that they have. I think there's there's two things, right? That I like to think one is like for the user perspective, and then for the, the network perspective. Like I, I can just measure everywhere I'm going, and I can see how bad or good is my connection. How do you guys incentivize users to actually? contribute with data with their phones yeah now we give them points and uh, in the future we're going to use the points as a reputation system meaning that if you're a good citizen and you perform the tasks you're going to be uh, rewarded the points and uh, if you're not a good citizen so basically if the points uh, if you promise to do a task like if you promise to be in a place and do a measurement and if you don't do your reputation will be degraded representing uh, the value that uh, you have missed or not and of course, there will be representation of the data value, which is planned to be with the actual uh, token. So whenever the data is monetized, you're going to receive a representation of the of the value of uh, of your contribution. Uh, of course, this is all subject to all the legal and compliance check that now we're careful to do. So what you promise and what not to promise. And uh, yeah, we're going to start testing this now. Uh, so basically. To preempt one of your questions, so uh, we are we have joined uh, the up and coming uh, Peak ecosystem, and uh, basically we're going to allow or we're going to join the Peak tasks or missions. So basically, ROM users, when they perform certain the tasks, they're going to actually be uh, eligible to claim uh, Peak tokens, and uh, basically this will be immediate value that users can get uh, by contributing and joining the system. Yeah, that that's that's super super interesting. I think uh, a lot of projects. Um, are starting with the point system because it also allows them to have to test the networks that test the waters right before actually committing with the tokens because once the token is live, there's no way there's no way back. One thing I, I don't really see like in, in Europe the same thing I see in the US. In the US there's a big competition between you know, Verizon, AT and T, and T-Mobile mainly, and everyone claims like you know nationwide 
coverage and they have the maps and everything like that, which is probably not true because the US, the coverage is really bad, right? Considering, comparing to Europe, for example, or Asia. So now you're actually being able to have a, a real map and then call BS from those, from those like uh, telco companies, right? What they're trying to say. When people are using the network, how do you guys like uh, handle privacy? You know, like I, I'm basically, I have a fingerprint that you can tell me everywhere I'm going. If I'm doing something like I'm trying, maybe I tell my girlfriend I'm going somewhere, I go somewhere else, you know, like, okay, now she'd be able to track me. Uh, how do you guys handle privacy in this sense? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So I think we handle privacy in a, in a way that, uh, yeah, that we ask you that you like your date to be shared to start with. And uh, at least, at least we ask you, and then we try to follow it. Um, if you think about uh, most of the apps in your phone are asking for locations and uh, even access to some of those other services, permissions that you could see on Android, and you don't know why they ask these things. So, I mean, they do it because they trace you and they actually collect data and they try to monetize on you by things that you don't understand. So uh, I think it's clear in the web to world that if you don't know how and what is being monetized that you are the product. In our case, uh, we tell you that this data is needed because of that purpose, right? Because we collect data from mobile network operators. And then you can see the data. And then, of course, if you want, your data can be deleted uh, and we stand for that. What we plan to do now with the blockchain technology is to enable also to see how your data, where your data went in a colloquial term. So basically, how or who was the buyer of the data? And then you could select if you want... Uh, all the possible monetization, then fine. If you want the data to be used only for mobile network optimization, right? Then the data will be only used for that. So basically, we're not going to sell it for other type of uh, customers, such as deep in projects or regulators, which is not bad, right? Because some regulators are actually there to make sure that uh, the service provider delivers the right service to you. Or even other type of projects. I mean, we know that there is a strong correlation between uh, mobile network uh, performance data the data we collect and uh, weather, for example. So if you want this data, it can be used also for weather forecasting and so forth. So uh, I think that's one of the great functionalities or features of the blockchain because it allows this use case, which previously were more or less unimaginable, and it allows it at scale and uh, cost. So basically it allows this to be done as a real business, not just as a prototype. <laughs> Why have more than 50 DPINs choose to build on PIC? It's super fast, scalable, low cost, and offers builders a ready to deploy DPIN backend. PIC is also home to the fastest growing DPIN ecosystem in Web3, with lots of relevant enterprise, more than a million vehicles and devices, and over 50 DPIN across 18 industries. And that's just the beginning. Building a DPIN? PIC's DPIN grant program is focused on giving you everything you need to launch record breakers in record time. The PIC network in Tokyo will launch later this month. Check out PIC's channels for more details. You can find links in the description of this podcast. By building this network, where do you see like regions of the world that the biggest opportunities lie on this? It's the US, Asia, South America, Europe. Yeah, so I think everybody in the podcast should go to the Deep in Hub IO and then check the Rome Explorer. <laughs> it's live, so we have uh, real data now integrated there. Uh, and then you could see the areas of the world that data has already been collected. Um, I think the funniest thing that I saw, and we never really paid full attention, is that uh, a lot of people don't turn off uh, airplane mode on their phones. And then you could see people flying across uh, US, Australia, Europe, uh, I mean, somebody was flying uh, over the Iceland nicely with the phone, which is okay, actually. So, <laughs> but uh, but uh, actually, strangely enough, this data is used everywhere, not only in places where there is a poor coverage, which was kind of everybody thinking that some places maybe don't have uh, underserved areas, uh, but it's also is usable also in places where there is a high-density environment. Uh, but coverage is there, but the throughput is not there. So basically the performance is not there. And that's quite interesting because this means that this kind of data would always be needed and would always need to be fresh, meaning that uh, up-to-date and contemporary after some changes. So uh, basically you mentioned something about US, some I mean, coverage there, but actually most of the places are now dramatically changing as an environment. So 
in a urban area now the biggest issue is not outdoor anymore uh, but indoor because most of these uh, urban cities are now becoming canyons of glass buildings which are highly isolated and act like mirrors reflective surface if you think about sun rays i mean sun is basically or sun rays are just uh, another type of electromagnetic frequency on a very high frequency so so basically same as uh, your coverage or connection to the internet it reflects of the building and inside the building you don't have the same uh, connection as outside the building so um, practically speaking anywhere in the world data is needed um, that's why we actually encouraging the users to turn their phones and to uh, and to keep roaming uh, or going around with the app on uh, all the time and then the latest thing that we have added here and uh, I encourage everybody to try it um, because you get additional points is that uh, on the app now you get uh, this feature that you can share insight uh, share details and then uh, it gives me the option to show that now I'm uh, indoor and then I can select which floor I'm indoor and then I can confirm it and then when I do that I get additional points so I get 100 points more we are capping this now to a thousand, so otherwise people will be just clicking, clicking. I mean, this is this is not a hamster app, right? So it's like, it doesn't it doesn't make any sense if you're just in the same place that you are just click, click, click uh, all the points. That's the other thing that we're careful that uh, the data we collect actually has intrinsic value. I mean, you cannot from here check that yeah, my measurement is from a restaurant which is thirty minutes or thirty meters away. I mean, this is not how it works. So it's like, you can, it doesn't make any sense if you do that. So uh, what we do is uh, always make sure that uh, every work that the app does and your contribution actually has a physical value. I mean, physical meaning physical world, even though this is a funky term now in the in deep in space. But uh, the actual the intrinsic value is there. Uh, we just want the community to, to, to be clear that uh, what they do actually makes sense for them and also for the rest of the community because it's not only your mobile network that you'll be improving you'll be improving everybody else in this area yeah and i think uh especially like as the internet gets faster like the frequency of the like 5g going from 4g to 5g then the amount of cells required is much higher right so the quality of service actually decreases a lot by like uh, if you get a, a, a higher frequency antenna so you really need to be you know, like outside or closer to the antenna, etc. So I think this project gets more and more important as the technology is also advances, right? Oh, you have read, yeah, you have read your background. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's this is how it works, right? If you think about it, in the old days of the GSM networks, where you had just phone call, right? Basically, in a, you had every one antenna or this kind of a base station every uh, couple of kilometers. So five kilometers, even 10 kilometers in urban area. I mean, nowadays uh, in in cities, you need to have a 5G base station every couple of hundred meters or so 500 meters. And uh, that's why this is actually is unsustainable to keep on developing in the same way. So that's why decentralization of ownership is also a big topic. But before we go there, uh, let's first understand what and where needs to be built because then it will give a much better understanding of the techno-economic uh, situation so that then, then uh, the decision makes we realize that the current way to build networks is not sustainable, and most likely we need to tap in different ways. And uh, most likely, decentralized uh, infrastructure or neutral host type of, as it's known in the standardization, make a lot of good sense here. How are you thinking about the token economics going forward? What are the things that users can do? How can uh, they benefit from using the project after the tokens? And how the telco companies also can benefit? Are they going to be buying this data or you're going to be i think you mentioned in the past something about uh getting like sw swapping sim cards what is the business model that you're foreseeing for the project for us uh, the central value in the tokenomics is that uh, you as a user you're contributing data of course colloquial term is that you can mine i guess <laughs> mine uh, mine the value with your phone uh, then once you do that uh, we're going to have a, an intermediate nose that can check if your data is uh, correct or not we call these validators let's classical uh, term here and then uh, the data once is validated is then uh, for us is then uh, forwarded to a potentially or to a paying customer once they actually confirm the payment 
And then uh, this is converted, uh, the payment if they're paying in fiat to uh, the actual token, which is then distributed back to the user and to the validator for providing the service. The other value stream is that uh, you can perform additional tasks and this task would be like uh, be in a place in time uh, at a certain event with certain number of people of your friends or in a party and then uh, this would actually be creating uh, certain measurements that uh, typically called drive through or drive uh, testing and again this creates again uh, uh, same flow that data is shared and then it's being checked for quality and for validation and then if this is okay you're being released uh, of course the uh, other type of streams are following the same concept so basically if you are if you're performing a task like uh, changing network operator this is again a task that can be validated and if you do that uh, you are rewarded from the same pool because somebody paid for you to do this or uh, if you actually uh, again want to purchase even this service for yourself this could also be part of the token flow yeah that's that's in essence is what we're going to describe uh, now in more detail as the tokenomics. But of course, the white paper cannot be fully, fully published before we go to full legal compliance. And it, it is, it's, yeah, it's important. I think more and more crypto is getting regulated, which I think is important as well uh, to bring a legitimacy to to the whole ecosystem, right? And and these kind of things, like for example, I know for a fact that all the projects that wants to be trading tokens in Europe they must comply with like a standardization of, of white papers. Uh, that's something that's not actually required yet, but very soon will be. So there's a lot of things, you know, that projects needs to, to if you want to get real, like the PIC team, uh, you really need to actually go through some sort of compliance and talking to lawyers and doing these things correct. Um, otherwise, it's just going to be, you know, as your project goes, gets bigger and bigger, you're going to be in the eyes for the SEC and then complying problems and, and et cetera, right? So definitely something that's also good for all the founders out there to keep in mind about that. Also, one, one topic that I think is super interesting is like the ROM touches in the idea of global digital inclusion, right? How do you think that ROM can help increasing the mobile network access for underserved communities? Yeah, that's, again, was our, one of our original ideas. And the original idea would be that um, there are places in the world which are not connected to the internet. And uh, regardless of what we think, uh, still the most efficient way to connect to the internet uh, is to have something in your pocket that works uh, and is cheap, which is a standard mobile phone. So I'm, to I'm saying in contrast to lower satellite, uh, for example, so people know the Starlink, but there are also other services there. And the problem with them is that they're always going to be further away than uh, the thing next to your head, basically. So it's still going to be kilometers away. So basically, efficiency is not there. Um, so that's why phones, standard phones connected to standard uh, mobile equipment uh, base stations is the most efficient way. Then with that in mind, how about we put uh, a base station in a village or in a city, which now currently has poor internet connectivity? And we give people uh, $50 uh, or they buy it, $50 uh, for g phones. And then all of a sudden they will have an actual 4G service. Of course, then the base station itself can be connected via Starlink, you know, to have a connection for all. But uh, the way to distribute the signal for the last uh, couple of kilometers, the most efficient way will be to use a mobile network service. And then... Um, the way to do it this efficiently is to use a standardization technology to connect uh, this base station to the rest of the network, which could be a selected operator that has uh, interest and has capability to serve this area. And this is what uh, we believe could be the future of, uh, of actual decentralized connectivity. So uh, basically using standards and using the most efficient technology for the last uh, couple of hundred uh, meters or kilometers, a couple of kilometers, and uh, this starts with the end device of what can people afford to use and to buy. And of course, then the question becomes who pays for this. And then this could be another, another good idea to look into the decentralized pool of ideas. So then decentralized financing options to finance the deal because you know that it's not going to go away. There is a steady income and somebody pays for that could be the way to happen. So basically combining what we currently call DeFi and DeepIn to create a real value for the users, I believe is very doable and achievable. We have all the components. 
We just need to start executing. What are the most exciting things that you see in Rome, like towards this year and to like the next few years? What we can show to the users in the next two weeks is the new website. So it's actually coming with a new brand look and uh, new colors. And I've been told that we've been too much telco. Let's be a bit more also Web3. So <laughs> it's a bit, uh, I mean, yeah, old habits, right? And then a new version of the same will be applied to the app. So basically uh, on the website, the biggest change is that uh, we're going to make it very clear that uh, we have a roadmap for the users so that you can use directly. And also there is an enterprise section. Um, so actually we call it for what Web3 things, but basically we can call it for the actual customers so that uh, I can actually discover the services and then can test the service before they make the commitment. Uh, and of course, we have the integration to the uh, uh, Deep in Hub with the map there, so people can see uh, what they have collaborated and how much percentage of the world has been covered. And then on the app, uh, the major additional features would be uh, full integration of all the missions and tasks that we can unleash together with uh, Peak, which actually talks about gamification and we're going to have tiers and, and badges and uh, you know things to encourage you to come back to the app and to participate more and of course to earn more of the how to get rewarded or to be able to claim the peak tokens that uh, tasks are uh, related to. And then uh, after that, uh, we're going to push towards the iOS version of the app. Why we don't have iOS version now? Because uh, Apple is a very closed ecosystem. So they don't give access to the uh, APIs that we can get this data automatically. But because we have uh, users that want to do things so uh, we can encourage people or we can actually give instructions what kind of a dial uh, codes to put to get to the uh, test field menu of apple and then uh, what kind of uh, um, screens to put into the bookmark and then uh, how to take a screenshot of that and then the app can actually automatically record the data and then send it so that you can get even more rewards because this is not possible not only for us, but for anybody else. So the actual telecom world doesn't know how Apple phone perform. So this will be actually quite a unique uh, value there. And uh, last but not least, we are further pushing towards uh, the value creation. So the demand side, uh, we already have uh, the first uh, customer that we just signed this week that is actually creating a consumer service with their own data. So uh, watch out, they're going to we're going to have a major announcement uh, to highlight and to show together with them their service uh, and then create additional analytics for the other potential customers or paying customers is, uh, of course, something that we're still going to invest in. Make sure that this data and your contribution actually have real value, not just uh, uh, make believe value for the future. So that's uh, still our credo here. Exactly. And where can people know more about the project? Where they can go? The website is uh, Rome Network, so one word dot x y z. So it's like Rome and Network together <laughs> dot x y z. Uh, I'm a bit of a careful. There is another project called Rome Network, so they just rebranded themselves a couple of months ago from MetaBlocks. So uh, they're doing Wi-Fi, we're doing wireless network, so slightly different concept. So, but our website or domain is still uh, Rome Network dot x y z. You can also make sure to go to Deep in Hub where they have all the links for Twitter and everything else, also information. Uh, and, and of course, the map, right? That we, we collaborated together to build the map. And it's always impressive how, how broad the map is already. So I'm very excited to, to see this growing exponentially in the next few months. Yeah, thanks so much for joining to the podcast, Mike. It was, it was a really nice talk to you about Rome Network. I'm very excited to, to see how this project grows and and it, 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 there's a lot of work to be done and it's exciting to see this. Everyone, make sure to go to deepinhub.io, subscribe to the newsletter. There's going to be a lot of cool things coming up there and subscribe to the, to the podcast on YouTube and, and Spotify and everything else. Uh, well, see you soon. Uh, this, this episode is being recorded before Singapore, so I'm going to see Micho in, in Singapore. So see you guys later. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Danny. Ciao. Cheers.